Welcome back. So if you're just joining us, we're taking a keen look at our academic situation here in Kenya. And just to refresh our memory, let's have a look at what Cabinet Secretary of Education, Dr. Fred Matiangi, had to say earlier this week that has really prompted this conversation. An official of the union, you leave Maseno, you go to the University of Nairobi, you hold a meeting there at the Great Court, uh, you tell your colleagues to go on strike. Then you leave there, you go to Dathan Kimathi University. Then you leave there and go to Chuka. Then you leave there and go to Kabianga University. Who pays for that time? We stop hiring anyone on full, on permanent and pensionable terms in the universities, especially non-technical people. Let's now move. And councils, I'm giving you an next assignment. Let's move to contracts. We are not going to allow the opening of any satellite campuses anywhere in the country. Let's just leave it that way. Because... You understand that that affects the quality of education. If we can get our children to go to school in India or go to school in Australia, there's no reason why our children cannot go to the University of Nairobi from whichever part of this country. Or there's no reason why our children cannot go to Kenyatta University or JK Uart or Masinde Muliro from whichever part of this country. We want to say that the government's behavior, it is uncalled for. This is as a result of desperate and their desperation cannot be just pumped to we cannot stay at the receiving end we are very sad we also want to advise the university administration to come out clean to communicate amicably and give us their stand because students cannot be here walking all over taking lunch paying bills eating and yet Parents can never withstand such uh, double uh, economic kind of pressures. The cabinet minister, we have been seeing him come out strongly and with a stamping authority that uh, exam cheating is to be stopped, rioting should be stopped, and everything is brought into an order. But we are failing to see him in this case of the university strike, which means he gives a hand into it. We put the government on notice because we have realized that there are tricks to deny us our basic need, and we promise them that the comrades' patience it is at the elastic limit. And very soon, believe you me, it will break. We have given the government, and mark these words, we have given them 72 hours, just 72 hours. They need to do something to help us uh, solve this stalemate. So, or else, if they don't do that, we will declare this strike a national crisis. All right, so you've had a few um, thoughts there from students. Um, let's continue with this discussion here in studio. Gentlemen, allow me to play the devil's advocate here. Not every government is perfect. There is no government that is perfect. So when uh, Cabinet Secretary Dr. Fred Matiangi says that um, the issue of, of employment status has to be posed on, he says that the whole point of that is to review the quality of education that we are giving to our students. Don't you not think that's a good enough reason? All right. Um, I want to start first by saying this. Dr. Matiani has no mandate whatsoever in telling our union how to run its affairs. He's overreaching himself, and right now you can see he even wants to extend his dictatorial tendencies towards how union is running. This should be a straight up to Matiangi. Keep off how we run our union. It is a legally constituted body and it is recognized by the Labor Relations Act. Remember, we have not told him how to run the Minister of Education, combining it with the Minister of Interior. He jumps one place, he's going to quell a riot. He jumps the next place, he wants to give a decree about how university education is running. Who told him he can be able to do that? Mm. And then starting to tell our union members, I mean our union officials, that you are in this place doing this, you've gone to another place doing that. Let him desist from his dictatorial tendencies. We are not going to take Matiangi telling us how to run our union. But that's on the side. I would want to focus on the issue because we are going astray. The most important and pressing issue is this CBA. Mm -hmm. Now let me tabulate it for you. Remember the Salaries Remuneration Commission when it was activated after the 2010 Constitution. When it came into play, the first thing it did was 
There is not going to be any discussion about CBS. We have to constitute ourselves as an advisory body. And once we do, we will tell you. We had a running CBA that time, 2010, running to 2012. They said, forget about it. And we said, all right, fine, we are going to comply. The moment they came in, they said, you know what? We are moving the cycle. It is no longer going to be a two-year cycle. We are moving it to two to four years. We said, OK, fine. Here is our proposal. From 2010, after the 2012 uh, CBA, the talks just, it became a game of musical chairs. From 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, until 20, we had to call for an industrial action for them to come and negotiate with us. Mm. Now, 2017, once we have negotiated and said, you know what, it's belated. You can imagine the opportunity cost of missing out from an entitlement for over five years. 2017, they say, okay, fine. Here is your money. Do you know first we had to go on strike? 54 days for them to implement it. And when they implemented, three things happened. They released the first tranche. You know, this is musical chairs. They released the first tranche, 47%. All right? Then they kept quiet. We were wondering what's happening here again. We had to go on strike again for them to adhere to their own understanding, our own understanding that this is something we have registered. Then they released the next 53%. After releasing that, they went back to the salaries of 2010. Look at how they are doing this. Now, we are supposed to even to be having a CBA from 2017 to 2021, which, by the way, other civil servants are already partaking in it. Partaking in it all right? They have yet to satisfy a CBA that has really lapsed. They haven't paid up to it. Mm. And right now, Matiani is introducing even other extraneous issues on how the union is supposed to run. Mm. I mean, I want you to see through this. This is a ruse. And we are simply telling the cabinet secretary, please do your work if you think you are this competent. Do your work. Pay up. Do, do, don't reduce lecturers into this band of people who are continuously agitating for their pay. We are supposed to be much more than that. We are supposed to engage this country in fine-tuning its development. Mr. Manyasa, your thoughts on this, especially now uh, that Dr. Wasonga mm -hmm. came out and said that this new directive is really shifting focus um, from the actual issue here, which is the 2013-2017 CBA that the government itself signed. <laughs> the, the, the truth is that the CS uh, was playing diversionary on the issue of the CBA. But I think he mixed a number of issues that should not be mixed. We have issues with the university and the expansion and all this. We have issues. Yeah? Apparently, government seems to be comfortable uh, having some quirks within the university so that when there is a problem, they come back and say, anyway, you are quirks, so we cannot even pay you this. They can generalize about everybody. Uh, why am I saying this? Because I remember in 2006 when there was a strike and uh, Kilemi Mwiri was assistant minister for ed education then. When he was confronted with the figures that was was putting forth, he said, if we were to pay this, we'll have to look for better people to pay this money. Mm -hmm. Meaning, they understand that we have mixed uh, potatoes and, and, uh, and yams and everything within the university. There are several issues that we need to isolate. One, there is CBA, which I think the government should just honor. Uh, that, that should not be a discussion. Once that is honored, the second thing that we need to ask ourselves is, is the expansion of universities sustainable in the manner in which we have been undertaking it? And, and, and what is the logic behind it, uh, this expansion? Uh, that I think we need to separate from this dispute that is right now ongoing, the industrial dispute. Then there is the issue of when we decide as Kenya that we want to create this much public service, what is the role of SRC? Does it still have a role? Do we need to have it in the first place? Because I think that is one of the institutions that failed Kenyans resoundingly.
And, 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 and I don't know whether it is the people there or it is the structure of the institution, but it has failed Kenyans resoundingly. And, re and really speaking about the issue of the SRC yeah. and them, uh, as you said, letting Kenyans down largely, yeah. what would you say, how can we, how can we resolve this situation Make, and, and still have the quality of education intact? Quality of education, you know, the quality of an output is a function of the quality of inputs. Mm -hmm. the, 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 that is what I was taught in economics. That when you put in junk, you produce junk. Right now, we are inputting a lot of junk into our education system, and it is at all levels. And that is a problem for me. Mm -hmm. Why is it a problem? Because I told you I taught for 11 years in the university, and I saw very many bright students come to university and get discontinued from university on academic ground. Why? Because they got disillusioned. You come to university and you have, <laughs> you go to class and you wonder, did I have to work hard to come here? Jonathan Messiah, yeah. your thoughts on this issue? I think uh, picking from where my two brothers have left it, we need to be asking ourselves, why are universities expanding? Why are we having these campuses left, right and centre, some on top of churches, others on top of bars? It is a function of funding. As he mentioned, when you become a vice chancellor, you have in your job description a function of demonstrating that your institution is growing. Growth is a function of numbers. Growth is a function of research output. For you to engage in all these things, you need to generate income. That is how the parallel program or module two in some campuses began. Because the state is failing to channel resources that are adequate to make a university function. But it is also a political tool that the government has been using. Because if you look at how university councils and senates are formed, it is by you know, your political affiliation, the colors you put on Zinzi today will determine if you're going to be appointed into uh, the council of the university that shall be formed tomorrow. Instead of picking people who've been in the practice, who have managed universities, sitting on a council of a new university so that they help it grow, we are picking uh, people because of uh, their political inclination to manage institutions of higher learning when they have no understanding on the process of knowledge creation. Gentlemen, let's touch on the issue of the new curriculum because of time, very quickly. Do you think that this is a triumph for Kenya's children? Jonathan, let me start with you. Um, the reform process in the education sector is a welcome idea. Any system must be able to change itself. My biggest problem with what we are proposing for 2018 is how we are pegging it on a political calendar, how we are pushing it that it must happen at a particular time. Mm. We've carried out a pilot in a limited number of schools in 47 counties. We've not analyzed the results out of that pilot. Nobody has tested to know if the teachers are ready to roll it out. But politically, we've made a decision that 2018 is the date to go. Mr. Manyasa, your thoughts on the new curriculum? I was very supportive of the new curriculum. I still am. Um, I think that we, we need to move. However, uh, I agree with Jonathan entirely that uh, we have skipped important steps in the process of curriculum review, reform, sorry. And I think that we stand a very high risk right now if we don't pause and take a step back and, and make sure that we follow every other detail in the process of just doing what 844 did. 844 is a good system. It was rashly implemented. That failed it from the start. We are walking the same path. Dr. That, that I fear. That you lot. fear. Yeah. And Dr. Maloba, do you feel like the industry is ready to take, um, to take in these new students, given that now we also have a new curriculum to establish? I wish I could just get some more time so that I can explain this in a little good detail. First, let us go back and ask ourselves what is education. Education is actually a package. That package is the one which we bequeath you so that you can unravel life 
for the benefit of self and for the benefit of society. But this society that is having this education must also define the aspirations that it wants for its future. That is the first thing. Now, it is these aspirations that are ameliorated into a curriculum so that now we can give you that education. For instance, if we want a society that we want a society of merchants, what do we do? We say we are very good at selling things. So our aspirations is to become the best merchanting enterprise in the world. That means our aspirations is that we have then to ameliorate that aspiration into a package system that can now translate in creating better people who will know how to market that a product they have. Mm -hmm. They will have research to find out which product best can be developed. They will see how they can develop salespeople who can be able to do that. And you see, we have that in the world examples. Look at the UAE. They know that we only have petrodollars, all right? A petrodollar-based economy. So how are our aspirations? We want to be able to sell. That's why they formed, all right, unfortunately, I'm going to say cartel, but OPEC, because they know this is what we want to do. So their aspirations are actually ameliorated within how petroleum industry is going to enable their economy. Look at Singapore a country that is full of swamps. They said, we want to industrialize. Our ambition is to become the best industrialized country which can be able to attract investment in industry here. What did we do in 1963? We did not first even ameliorate it into ambition. What we simply said were three things. We want to get rid of poverty, ignorance, and disease. Did we have an ambition to do that? No, we simply wanted to get rid of that. So we set up a curriculum that can be able to determine only those three. But you see, no one has ever come and say, the Western country of this can, uh, the Western part of this country is a breadbasket. It's agriculturally rich. Why can't we make sure that that part of the country can be able to do as best as that? Northeastern, a rangeland. Let us see the best capacity we can have for that. Here in Central, White Islands, still agriculture, large scale. The coast province, complete with the hospitality industry, just like other countries which have never had anything. Look at Seychelles. Their aspirations, if you go there, every other person will tell you, we want to work in the hotel industry, in the hospitality industry, and most people who will find there work either in the hospitality industry, in the cruise liners, in the hotels, their aspirations are known. That's how you now flesh out a curriculum that can be able to harness all the energies and then direct them to the aspirations of our country. When we attempted to do that at 844, we started by looking at who is going to be a craftsman. Look at that. No, I say we want to do Akali people. Look at that. Right now, we are changing the system. We say we want to change. Have we been asked? No. Politicians have taken the lead. And according to them, they want to score political points. They want, someone wants to be, I was the one who started this, without even having consulted any professional who would then tell you, you know what, if you have to collapse this into this kind of system, then you have to tell me the aspiration that you have, which brings us back even to the expansion of the universities. Mr. That's Manyasa, why we're having chapters. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I, I think I'll, it would be unfair to say there was no consultation. There has been very extensive consultation on the new curriculum. It's, it's good to have the record straight. What, what is the problem is that at some point we have set a tight deadline on ourselves to match with some political goals. And, and that is the problem. Otherwise, the current, the proposed curriculum is very well thought out. If it is implemented, if it is given the right implementation framework, and the right resources, because that is the biggest uh, shortfall of, of what is proposed, that it is going to require a lot of resources to set up talent academies, to set up technical schools, so that they are different than the normal school, Gen and yet we haven't put resources there, and we are skipping that, but there has been consultation. Mr. Messiah, yes. what can we do to ensure as a nation that the transition is smooth? The, the, the transition can only be smooth if we look at the elimination of what I'll call system capture. A lot of resources that are allocated to the Ministry of Education end up being spent in Yogo House. 
we need to streamline Jogo House so that the resources go to the points of service delivery in the field out there. Because we are unable, as it is now, as uh, Dr. Manyasa is saying, to manage simple laboratories in secondary schools. Mm. How are we going to manage a talent academy? How are we going to manage uh, uh, um, an increased number of technical uh, schools that require greater infrastructure? But as we do this, let us invest in secondary education so that the secondary school has capacity to then obtain 100% uh, uh, transition from primary. Because we are only saying everybody who sits KCP should go to secondary school. Nobody is thinking about investing in secondary school now before the transition happens so that when the transition happens, we are ready. But as we think about secondary, we need to be thinking about university. Where are the places? Is it going to remain that university education is going to be a preserve of less than 10% of Kenyans? Is that what we want to do and we want to achieve Vision 2030? Manyasa, your thoughts on the issue of transition? If you ask me, and, and you can check all over the world, university education is not for the mass. If you massify university education, you lower the quality naturally. Uh, because if one engineer needs to work with 10 technicians in a properly functioning labor market, that means that only one out of 10 people should be a university graduate. We, we have made mistakes over the past many years by producing 10 engineers for every one technician. And the labor market is strange. It will pay the technician more than the engineer. It pays the scarce factor. And, and that is the whole thing that we need to be thinking about as we think about transition. At what point do we want to create technicians? How many of them in what fields? At what point do we want to create the engineers in what fields? Dr. Maloba, I'll, I'll allow you to have the last say, and that's on the issue of transition. I want first to agree with what my colleague has said here. And let us not call it elite. Let us not try and, you know, demonize the universities mm -hmm. as elite areas. No. That is actually the sad truth, that universities are actually places of knowledge generation. You cannot massify that sector and then imagine it is development. No, he's right. There is a cost and the cost is always going to be on quality. If we have to change this system, and if we have to make sure that the transition is fine, let us get our priorities right. Let us increase the number of mid-level colleges. Let us remove politicians from decisions which are on education matters. Let us allow our education professionals to set the agenda. Let us remove all that has actually become now populism about how to please one section or even a large mass of people for the political gain that mostly is short term. If we have to transit, let us make this transition in a way that captures the future aspirations of this country. Like I said, we need to define what this country needs to be. If we want to be a technological savvy country, let us define it so. And let us engage all sectors and create a curriculum that does that. If we want it to be agricultural based, then fine. If we want it to be hospitality based, and we can actually even have different compartments within the country so that each one of uh, the same is addressed. Personally, I would not have any problem if the university was only a citadel mm. where we can be able to consult, generate new knowledge, and then use that knowledge for the benefit of society, rather than massify it in short political game. Gentlemen, our time is up, but thank you so much for driving this conversation and helping us look uh, at our education sector very critically. I was with Dr. Maloba Wekesa as well as Emmanuel Manyasa and Jonathan.